This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. Hi, everyone. People often ask how they can support more great stories from the wild. Thank you for asking. The Wild is a joint production of myself and KUOW Public Radio, and you can support this vital work and become part of the Wild community by checking out our show notes. There you'll find information about supporting my wildlife organisation, Chris Morgan Wildlife, through Patreon. Help fuel the next adventure. Enjoy the episode. It's well before dawn. We're getting an early start in the hopes of setting up camp deeper in the swamp. We canoed across the river in total darkness, and then the trek began, through a rainforest that was starting to wake up. It was time to set up our tents on a small hill, a rare bit of semi-dry land in what seemed like the wettest place in the world. The well-known humidity of Sumatra was kicking my ass. And every step I'd had this disorienting feeling, I could only see what's right in front of me. My other senses were set on high alert. I knew that tigers and rhinos and bears were definitely here, possibly just past the circle of light from my headlamp. As I slipped into sleep, I began to dream about tomorrow. Because with any luck, I'd get to meet my first wild orangutan. That was a description of a trip I took to the Loza ecosystem of northern Sumatra in 2013. I was there to host a PBS nature film called The Last Orangutan Eden, all about the plight of the Sumatran orangutan. I always refer to them as refugees because the definition of a refugee is somebody whose homeland is no longer available to them. That's Dr. Ian Singleton in the film. He's the conservation director of the SOCP, the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Programme, and his job exists because Sumatran orangutans are in big trouble. They are losing ground as their rainforest home is destroyed. When plantations go in, they convert primary forests to palm oil. During that conversion process, they end up with barren land, and nothing survives that process. It's hard to find a spider or a lizard, you know. The Loza ecosystem covers over six and a half million acres. That's about the size of Colorado. It's wild. So dense with trees, it helps regulate the global climate. Not the orangutans being taken away from the forest, but the forest being taken away from the orangutans. That's because even though a lot of the Loza is technically protected by Indonesian law, illegal activities are still a threat, things like logging and poaching and burning the forest to make way for palm oil plantations. In just the last 35 years, Sumatra has lost around 50% of its tropical forest, which means a lot of animals without a home. And so, yeah, most of the 99% of the orangutans that end up in our quarantine center come from areas where the forest no longer exists. So they're, they're refugees from forests that don't exist anymore. Now, eight years after the PBS documentary, I want to catch up with Ian and the others I met to revisit this rainforest ecosystem and see how the research and rehabilitation work back then might have changed the lives of these amazing great apes. A journey back in time to learn about today's Sumatran orangutan. From KUOW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild. Listening to Ian talk about how he got started in his line of work feels a bit like the origin story of Indiana Jones. (laughs) But unlike Indy, Ian started out as a zookeeper. I worked at uh, Whipsnade Zoo outside London and uh, Edinburgh Zoo for a while with a lot of different species. You know, carnivores, tigers, polar bears, deer, camels. Camels are wacky. Um, Many different things. And, uh, And then one day I ended up working at Jersey Zoo with Gerald Darrell. And uh, the job I got there was, was on the apes. So I worked with orangutans and gorillas. 
Jersey Zoo is on the island of Jersey in the English Channel, and it's world-renowned. It's not just a zoo, it's a conservation organisation, and also a haven for more than 130 endangered species. Back then, not a lot of people had heard of orangutans. They'd all heard of gorillas and chip, chimpanzees and things, but uh, orangutans had never really been in the news much. And I found that the zoos, you know, historically, you, they built a new enclosure for the chimpanzees or gorillas and then moved the orangutans into the old one. And the orangutans never did very well in these enclosures because the habitats were designed for group-loving chimps and gorillas. Orangutans are pretty solitary creatures. It's hard to be a loner in a space that's designed for social gatherings. These loners tugged Ian's curiosity. And, and I suddenly thought, oh, no, why, why are they so misunderstood? You know, why are they so different? He saw this sparkling intelligence where others just saw big, red, furry lugs the antisocial stoner types of the ape world. So, in 1990, he began to visit Indonesia, the island of Sumatra, home to wild orangutans, to learn more about them. He got a PhD and then a job with a new group back then, the SOCP, and he's lived there ever since. It was Ian's world I entered eight years ago as we were making the TV documentary and we started at the heart of the operation, the Orangutan Quarantine Centre, so I could begin to understand what orangutans were facing firsthand. Ian and I flew to the centre in a small plane right over the forest canopy. I remember looking down seeing huge plumes of smoke punctuating this lush green carpet of treetops. Closer is the last hope for the Sumatran elephant, the Sumatran rhino, the Sumatran tiger, and the Sumatran orangutan. It's only here do you find the populations of these species still in viable numbers, hundreds if not a few thousand, compared to tens and dozens uh, elsewhere on the island. From the plain window, I could see that the orangutan's home was literally on fire. Ian and his team are here to stop this happening. The Orangutan Quarantine Centre is in Medan, capital of North Sumatra province, and it's kind of a halfway house for orangutans on their road to recovery. You see, when forests are cut down, people find young orangutans and they take them illegally as pets. The authorities then come in and confiscate them and bring them here. Most of the orangutans are very young, under five years old, and should still be with their mothers breastfeeding. But they are orphans. The ones I saw during my visit were so young that they were in diapers and being bottle fed. I, I know I'm not supposed to be touching them, which is the most difficult thing I think I've ever been through. Difficult because no one warned me just how totally adorable baby orangutans are. They have these deep set eyes and tiny faces and fuzzy bedhead hairdos. You try very hard to separate them from humans and... These guys used to be with their mothers. They've already gone through this trauma of being separated from a mother figure once. Oh. And the last thing we want to do is, is get them into that situation where they have to go through it again. One three-year-old had been found tied up in a plastic bag in someone's yard before being brought to the center. While I was visiting, he was learning to climb. Yes, you are doing so well. What a good pre-climber. I have to say, when you're looking at them, it is like looking into the eyes of a human being. There's so much going on back there. You can see the intelligence in their eyes. And it's that intelligence that can see them through to a new life, even after all the trauma they've faced. When a confiscated orangutan like this little guy comes to the center, Ian's team puts them into quarantine for a health check and observation. New residents get the full works, x-rays, blood samples, weights and measures. And once the orangutan gets the all clear from quarantine, they start on their paths to socialization with other orangutans and rehabilitation. The goal is to prepare the confiscated apes for release into the forest where they can live out the rest of their lives in the wild. During my visit, I also met a recent graduate of the rehabilitation program, a handsome guy named Udin. He's hanging from the chest of his caretaker, Mooklis, one arm hanging down, looking all around with eyes that look like they miss nothing. A character. It was hard to believe that this healthy youngster had arrived at the centre on the brink of death. When we found him, he was only recently captured and he, he, his mother had been clubbed or beaten with 
logs or a machete or something, but he, his skull was fractured. If, if we hadn't confiscated him, he would have almost certainly died. And how do you feel like he's going to do? It's a, he's a good candidate. And I think he'll do very well. And, and to, to, to look at him, he's going to be a very handsome male. Yes. He's going to be the, uh, the pick. Ian told me that sometimes he works with an orangutan that seems to have a special level of intelligence. Now, uh, Udin is one of those guys. We've seen him using tools, and he's always looking at ways to get at the padlocks and get other different things. The others probably recognise that fact and see him as the smart guy, yeah. Smart guy Udin had learned all he could from his human caretakers about orangutan survival. In fact, he'd begun to teach the other orangutans. A good sign he was ready. Ready to be released into his new forest home. Jantho Nature Preserve is in the northernmost part of Sumatra, and it is remote. The perfect place for orangutans. But getting there was one of the wildest rides of my life. Udin's too, I'm sure. 12 hours of winding up the roughest roads I've ever been on, standing in the back of the truck, hanging on for dear life, into the jungle in this convoy of old, bomb-proof four-wheel drive vehicles, getting stuck in the mud. Oh, crunch! And somehow, only one small crash. <laughs> but we made it, and we finally crossed the river that separated the orangutans from humans. Orangutans don't swim, so the river forms a natural boundary between the human camp and the orangutans. It's this place, well off the beaten path, that's really the culmination of Ian's work, the release site for the rehabilitated orangutans. As long as they can keep themselves alive for long enough, as long as they can maintain adequate nutrition uh, for a few years, they will develop a map of the area that they're released in and, and have a really good chance at survival. Before we started here, there was no wild orangutan population here, none at all. At that time, Jantho had about 54 orangutans, all graduates of the rehabilitation program. It's kind of like a orangutan Shangri-La, a place where they can live out the rest of their lives in safety. And it was time for Udin to join them. We walk up the hill with him. He's in Muklus's arms. And as we approach the tree line, Udin looks kind of nervous. It's a big day for him. Just then, though, an old buddy, an orangutan from the rehabilitation center, comes out from the forest to greet Udin. And it was as if something clicked in Udin's head. Maybe the comfort that he wouldn't be alone. So when Muklus loosened his arms and handed him off to a tree, Udin zipped right up it like he'd spent his whole life there. There he goes. Oh, look at that. Oh, straight up. Like he never left. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe how quickly he's gone up there. Wow. It's magic to see this. Hard to believe that just a few minutes ago he was in a cage down below, and now he's swinging around in the treetops like an orangutan should. And it was such a short leap from the arms of Muklis to that tree two feet away, but a profound step to freedom and a whole other world. It was one of the most heartening things I'd ever seen. I turned around to Ian as he looked on, and he was beaming like a proud parent. To see that they've gone from an animal with no future to a, a, an orangutan who possibly has a, a future as good as a wild uh, orangutan, uh, 50 years in the wild. And these, are, these guys will become the, the founding fathers. Over the years since my visit to Sumatra in 2013, I often wondered what happened to Udin after that incredible moment. Was he on his way to becoming a founding father, as Ian had predicted? Was he even still alive? When we come back from the break, we'll find out, and we'll revisit my travels to another part of Sumatra, where the secrets of orangutan intelligence are being uncovered, in a place that's commonly referred to as orangutan heaven in human hell. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. 
Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. Do you spend any time over here in the States? I was before the COVID, yeah. I was getting over there sort of at least once a year. I did a trip to New York, yeah. Yeah, well, if you're ever up here in the Northwest, you'll have to give us a shout and uh, I'll, sh- I'll show you some bears like you showed me the orangutans. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm genuinely excited to catch up with my fellow northerner, Ian Singleton, after so long. But I can't help noticing that he's a bit antsy. He clears his throat, (coughs) taps his pen, sips coffee. He seems a bit like a caged animal himself. And then I find out why. Because of the COVID, we haven't had so many visitors. So I've been, you know, back at my desk. I spent years trying to get away from my laptop. But everybody knows I'm kind of captive at the moment. This primate clearly wasn't cut out for a desk job. Finally, we get down to it, and I ask him the question I've been dying to ask. You know, in the, in the documentary, we watched Udin's progress, and at the end of the film, we were there as, as he was released by Mooklis, one of your team members, into the, into the wild. Mm-hmm. How did that turn out? What, what happened with Udin? Yeah, Udin, we still have him. Um, he's been released several times, but he's kind of a victim of his own intelligence. Apparently, after being released into the freedom of the forest in 2013, Udin went on a walkabout. He figured out that if he followed the river we crossed, he'd reach a human settlement, and he rather likes their company. Uh, We got a report once he was in some village dismantling a motorcycle, (laughs) trying to figure out how how that worked. Um, So we do still have him. Ian thinks that Udin is just a bit immature yet. He's about 16 years old now, and because orangutans develop so slowly, he's technically still a juvenile. If his mum was still around, he'd still be hanging out with her, but people took him from her when he was quite young. Maybe that's got something to do with his teenage waywardness. I think just as long as, you know, like humans, he's going to reach a certain age where, yeah, having a girlfriend becomes more important than having a toy car or whatever. (laughs) Or, <laughs> or a motorcycle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the Sumatran orangutan conservation program doesn't just rehabilitate orangutans, they study them as well. Understanding orangutan behavior can help scientists protect them. The program has 10 stations spread out across northern Sumatra. The Suwak Belimbing Monitoring Station is on Sumatra's northwest coast. Sawak is home to the densest orangutan population in the world. It's the perfect place for conservation biologists to learn about wild orangutans. Sawak is wet, and I don't just mean the rain. It's basically a giant peat swamp. But that doesn't bother the orangutans, because they spend their entire life up in the trees. Helps them avoid the tigers, too. Most of all, I remember the insects. (laughs) Swarms of them all over you, drinking your sweat and unceasing humidity. The forest is not an easy forest. You, you fall, you get hurt, you get stung, you get stabbed by thorns. I was here with Dr. Caroline Shupley, a Swiss evolutionary biologist who works at the Suwak station. But it's still that what you see is so rewarding that at the end of the day, you don't think about how hard it is. As a student at the University of Zurich, a question kept rolling around in Caroline's head. When we're kids, what forms our brains and makes us who we are? What is it that dictates what information gets in and changes us? She was drawn to orangutans because they spend a lot of time alone, and this makes them ideal subjects to study and learn about the effects of socialization and brain development. And like chimpanzees and other ape species, orangutans are really closely related to humans, a 97% overlap in our DNA. We have a lot in common with these intelligent relatives. In Malay, the word orangutan actually means person of the forest. I think in many aspects, our minds work surprisingly similar. And if we figure out how orangutans work, we are one step closer in understanding how humans work. And like Ian, Caroline was pulled in, wanted to study orangutans because of their subtlety. She had a feeling there was more to them. 
some people say when they're studying orangutans yet, but they're not doing anything when they're together. But you very quickly realize that that's not true. It's just more subtle clues. When I met Caroline during the documentary eight years ago, she and her team had been observing the orangutan population for four years. And let me tell you, she gives Ian a run for his money on the Indiana Jones front. Despite her measured academic tone, I got the impression when we were in Suwak that she didn't know exactly what to do in any temples of doom. Getting through Suwak is miserable. The researchers have put long runs of wooden planks on short stilts to walk on above the swampy water. (laughs) But I don't think they were designed with my 225 pounds in mind. Caroline seemed unfazed and conspicuously dry. Do you need a hand? (laughs) I'll just end up pulling you in. This was just another day at the office for her. Caroline's days routinely start at 3.30am when she makes her way to the orangutans in time to watch them wake up. Because her research is all about observation, staring at orangutans all day and meticulously recording what they do to figure out how they learn, what makes them tick. Actually, she listens first and then she watches. That's interesting. You wait and listen. You don't wait and watch. No, it's, di- no. it's, diffi- it's easier it, to hear them. It's so much easier to hear them. It's this shh, and it's different from other monkeys because other monkeys leap, and the orangutans don't. That's because orangutans move about the tree canopy using their body weight to swing. They bend one tree to the next, and that swooshing sound is the trees snapping back into place after they let go. It's beautiful to watch. During my time with her, I'd watch Caroline intensely staring into the trees, observing the orangutans all day, every day, constantly reaching for her clipboard, scribbling everything down. She was driven by fascination, pure and simple. When we talked recently, Caroline told me she'd just become an auntie. And for an animal behaviorist, her niece was irresistible. She's just the most fascinating uh, (laughs) living being on earth for me. And I'm really tempted to do uh, focal follows on her. So to just take uh, data on her, especially on her exploratory behavior, how she learns about objects and her surroundings. And I'm very tempted to just follow her as I would follow an orangutan, but she's too interested in me. So that that doesn't really seem to work. (laughs) And how do her parents feel about you studying her like a great ape? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, my sister is actually involved in our research. So she's uh, helping me with the data. And I think, of course, she's the mom. So she's more reserved, but she also gave me the okay to look at at some of the exploration rates of of my niece. That kid's going to have some stories to tell. During her research in Suwak, Caroline found that young orangutans have an incredibly long learning period. Ian's Udin was a good example, a wayward youth still learning life at 16. So this long period before weaning, those are the first eight years in an orangutan's life. But interestingly, orangutans then spend another around eight years as juveniles or adolescents before they start reproducing. And all during this first 16 years or so of an orangutan's life, they're learning, mostly from their mothers. Turns out that being a wild orangutan is a complicated business. There's finding food, using tools, which these Suwak individuals do, and how to move through the tree canopy without breaking any bones. Even how to build a nest. Here he goes. Let's hope it holds my weight. I had thrown on some climbing gear and hoisted myself up a scary tall tree. I wanted to see an orangutan nest for myself. It's not like a bird's nest where they, you know, collect branches and twigs and place them into a nest. The orangutan has actually snapped them back. Can you see that right there? It's broken the branch, pulled it, and created a framework that everything else sits on top of. So it actually feels quite secure. These nests are an important part of orangutan life. You can picture them up there, eating, sleeping, spotting neighbors and family members. And as I was up there, the most magical thing happened. I can hear a long call over there. That's amazing, I'm sitting in an orangutan nest and I can hear an orangutan. Shall I reply? Oh, I don't know if I can do it. Ooh. Ooh. 
It's, it's all gone suspiciously quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but orangutans aren't born knowing how to make a nest like the one I was sitting in. They have to learn from other individuals in the community. And they do that through a process called peering. Peering is when um, an orangutan is watching another orangutan from a very close distance. Basically, they watch and learn. A lot of watching. And we found out that they peer around 40,000 times in a lifetime. I was lucky enough to see some of this watching, this peering, when I was in Suwak with Caroline, thanks to Friska and Frankie, mother and son orangutans. Do you see the baby? That's Friska's two-year-old son, it's uh, Frankie. He's a very curious boy. At the time, mum, Friska, was 65, and Frankie was just a baby. And it's not just Frankie, his older brother is there as well. His name's Freddy. And Freddy actually spends a lot of time still with Frisco and his little brother. And interestingly, the mom, Frisco, she doesn't mind Freddy to hang around. In fact, she often takes care of both of them. So Freddy is allowed to sleep in her nest and she still bridges, so helps him to travel between trees. Bridging is when mom pulls two trees together up in the canopy to make it easier for the little ones to move about. It's amazing getting to watch them. Caroline tells me that Friska and Frankie are doing great today. But over the last few years, Friska the mom has needed something every parent can relate to. A little alone time. She always brought Frankie for the last few years to other females so that he could play with their kids. Lots of peer learning to be had in a situation like that. Almost like dropping her kids off at school. So she would like drop him off with the others and then retreat and she would spend the day in maybe 50 meters a distance of everybody while Frankie was uh, had the opportunity to play with these other kids and feed with these other kids and only for bedtime she would call him um, oh. or go grab him. Um, <laughs> That's just so delightful. <laughs> you know, you sound like you're describing a Disney movie. This idea of learning different skills from different individuals is called vertical and horizontal transmission. Vertical if they learn from from their mothers and horizontal if they learn from other individuals. So it makes these guys perhaps extra smart or extra fast learners? That's exactly what I'm looking at. Because we are thinking that it is the opportunities for social learning that determine how smart you will be as an adult. One of the things that Caroline has observed is that male and female orangutans have something like friendship. These are females with young kids. There is nothing in it in terms of reproduction for the male and still they seem to enjoy spending time together and sometimes they even stay overnight so we had sleepovers of males in females nests oh i'd love to be invited to an orangutan sleepover (laughs) (laughs) i i I don't (laughs) all of these close intimate interactions are the perfect environment for peering if you're allowed to be close to another individual the likelihood that you can observe this other individual while it's doing something relevant is higher and so knowledge is more likely to get best passed on at SWOC than at other populations. Is studying orangutan behavior important for people and how? I would say so. If even the least sociable of all ape depends on social inputs during its development that just shows how important those social inputs must be for humans. And of course the implications of that are huge. If taking cues from others and absorbing information just by being around them is an important factor for human learning, just think what that could mean for how we approach school curricula, how we raise our kids, elder care. By studying our genetic cousins, Caroline is in effect learning how human brains have evolved. Hearing about the lives of wild orangutans in Suwak almost makes it easy to forget how endangered these creatures are. Critically endangered, actually. And it's not a problem with an easy fix. I remember Caroline telling me about it during my visit. She might have been unfazed by the swamp, but as we sat on a riverbank, she looked over as a small boat full of locals goes by. For the first time, she looked distant and emotional about the conflicting realities of the people in the area and the orangutans. Yeah, it's just a very complicated issue because people that cut down trees come from the same village as, for example, the people that work for our orangutans here. 
So it's all interconnected and their family ties maybe even. So it's so complicated, so complex. When we recently spoke, I asked her if she felt like orangutans were any safer now than they were eight years ago during the documentary filming. I think no orangutan is safe at the moment. Deforestation is proceeding, we're losing habitat, we're losing populations. She does think that the orangutan population in Suwak is a little better off than it was, though. And that's thanks simply to the physical presence of the SOCP team. We managed to keep this particular corner of the forest safe over all these years. Saving even a few orangutans can have long-term impact because of how orangutans learn passing knowledge on to future generations. And if we lose too many individuals, then in the, in the end, knowledge will die out. And we're not just losing individuals, but we're losing entire cultures. I've seen in, in, in the last sort of 20, 30 years uh, here, a big change in attitudes amongst the, the urban middle classes. You know, there's a lot more concern and understanding and appreciation of, of wildlife and animal welfare issues than there was 20 years ago. I'm glad to hear that Ian Singleton agrees with Caroline, agrees that some change for the better is being made. It still has a long way to go to filter out into the villages uh, in the campus next to the forest itself. But but it's a a work in progress. Ian and others at SOCP are working on another solution too. Some orangutans are not healthy enough for life back in the wild. So the team is building a new orangutan rehabilitation centre for permanent residents. And it's just down the road from the city of Medan, where several palm oil companies are based. I want to be able to change the behaviour. Yeah? I want to get people like the director of a palm oil company to come in and make them make that connection between sort of the signatures that they do on a daily basis in their office in Medan and the impact it has at the other side of the island on orangutans and forests and other species. Yeah. Ian's hope is that these orangutans will become the ambassadors for their wild cousins. And of course, the impact of this work doesn't just stop at orangutans. Other animals make this place home. Sumatran tigers, Sumatran elephants, and Sumatran rhinos, one of the most endangered large mammals on Earth. Protecting orangutans protects all of these species as well. I can't help but think we have a lot to learn from these old ancestors in this secret corner of the world. Not just about our own minds, but about the power of community, teaching and learning. Perhaps even in time to do the right thing by these beautiful people of the forest. One more thing I thought you'd love to know. Caroline told me that Friska, Frankie's mum, is now about 73 years old and is doing well. So well, in fact, she's about to give birth once again. Another playmate for Frankie and another young orangutan to continue the lineage of this orangutan village. I'd like to thank 13 Productions for their permission to use excerpts from The Last Orangutan Eden from Nature on PBS. We'll have a link with more information about the documentary at our website, thewildpod.org. There, you'll also find information about supporting the wild and the wild community we're building through my organization, Chris Morgan Wildlife, on Patreon. There's a link in the show notes. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Mark and Rebecca Wilkins, Bob Yellowlees, and Paul Lister. The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. Our producers are Daisha Clay and Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor and helped produce this episode. Our production team includes David Brown, Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Kara McDermott, Theo Popescu, Darcy Riggins-Schmidt and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm your host, Chris Morgan. Thanks so much for listening.